First of all, happy Equinox, everybody, and welcome to our global meeting, celebrating and exploring what it means to be human. For those of you that were with us this morning, uh, the first part, it's lovely to have you um, stay with us. For the rest of you, warm welcome if you're joining us from around the globe. Um, from the start, we have already been to Oceania, um, we've been to East Asia, we've been to Asia, we've been to the Middle East, and now we're in the Africa Culture Zone. And this is event number five out of eight events across the 18 hours. But please don't worry if you missed anything, because as you heard before, Lena is recording and will make things available. My name is Yusefa Fawcett and I'm based in the UK and this is Lena Rachel Anderson and she's from Denmark. So Lena, would you like to um, do some practicals and say hello? Yes, absolutely. I'll uh, just start with a little bit of uh, practical information for everybody, which is that unless you're one of the speakers, <laughs> uh, please keep your microphone turned off. Um, and if you need to move around, some people have been walking their dogs, some have been uh, uh, fetching breakfast in the kitchen, please turn off your camera because if you move or uh, make any kind of noises, the algorithm will put you up front and we will have you on video um, making noises or walking your dog or something like that. So, um, so please uh, feel free to uh, have your camera on while you're um listening and uh, if you move around please uh, turn it off uh, there are a few other things to say about this event we started out calling it the global building day we changed it to the global meeting on equinox to make it more accessible to more people and then we chose the overall title for it to be what it means to be human because we created this book uh, last year no this year in March <laughs> uh, but the last time we hosted the the, the global uh event on equinox and this is a book with build on text from around the globe and the title what it means to be human was very popular so we thought this is really what we want to discuss and so we'll um we'll stick with that and um and we are humans around the globe and on that note i would like robert to share a link in our chat which is a link to a padlet it's a little tradition that we have here at our global meetings so you click on the link and you will see a map of the globe and you will see that around the globe there are now um, little pointy things and that is uh, participants from the previous event. So if you just joined, please find the, the dot with the plus sign in it, click on it and tell the Padlet where you are because then you can also appear on the global map and then we'll have this wonderful map from all eight events showing where our participants are. Uh, have been participating from um so um so this is a little little tradition that we have and um we will as you can tell we're gradually taking over the globe with um what it means to be human and good conversations and um friendly conversations and build them so um what could be better let me just uh, give you an idea of what we're going to be doing for the next hour and a half. Lena has already set the scene, a little bit of background, and hopefully you're plotting yourself onto that uh, Padlet map. In a moment, we're going to ask you a key question just to get us started. And Lena will explain sort of how she wants you to approach that question specifically. And then we have two speakers. We have Follerin from Nigeria and Dudane from Rwanda. And I'll give you proper introductions to them just before they speak. But they're going to speak for 10 minutes and they're each 10 minutes each. Let me get it right. And then we're going to have a breakout rooms for 20 minutes and you get a chance to discuss what they said and formulate some questions they will really pique your interest and you'll love the conversations because we've got we've got and had and still have some really insightful people that come into this we're just eager to share and continue the conversation and then we bring you back and you get to ask your questions um, that emerged from your group and uh, we do a roundup so it's quite an exciting one and a half hours um, Lena, what about this question to get them started? Yes. 
So uh, what we like to do is uh, we also have a very special topic for this particular global meeting on Equinox, which is how can we cooperate better both as a, as a species and also as, as local uh, communities. And we've asked a, a, a question that we would like you to think about what is stopping us from cooperating better? And what we would like you to do is to not write the answer in the chat, but take a piece of paper or write it somewhere else and you get two minutes. And the reason why we would like you to not write it in the chat is that we want everybody to present their own fresh thinking and personal answer to this question. Because if one person starts writing in the chat, then people are going to have an opinion about that, either agree or disagree. And then we won't get all the different answers that we would like to get. So I'm now going to give you two minutes where you um, can write your answer to what is stopping us from cooperating better. And, uh, and then we will return. And that was two minutes. So uh, please write your answer in the chat and let's see what uh, what people have come up with. Fear of discomfort. Yeah, that's a good one. There was also a competition in there. Fear of judgment. That's also a, a good point. Global inequality. Also a good one. Horrible one, but a good one. Um, So um, what we're going to do with all your answers is that Robert is going to gather all of them and make a word cloud. And then at the end of the session, we'll have this very special word cloud for the African session of the global meeting on Equinox. So uh, if you're still typing, please go on and then I'll hand it back to Josefa. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's move into the main part of the event. As I said, we've got two speakers. And the interesting thing about the way that speakers are, are going to present today is that it's on the back of a paper that has been written called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, <laughs> about what it means to be human. And there are eight sections, uh, AI, biotech, circularity, demographics, education, finance, global dispersal of knowledge, and human humanity and human rights. And we actually have one of the co-authors of that um, paper right now. And we're working through, there were eight sections, and you'll notice that there are eight events. So we're picking up one of the letters in each of the continents as we move around. So I'm going to introduce the speakers to you now. Each is going to speak for 10 minutes and then Lena um, is going to pop us all into breakout rooms so that you can have some great conversation about three things. Um, Robert, do you perhaps have that slide to pop up? Because obviously when you're listening to the speakers, the three things we're going to ask you to, to refer to. So what did you just hear? What did you learn? And what would be a good question to ask the speakers? Thank you, Robert. So this is listening with intent. So first of all, the first of the two speakers is Dr. Folarin uh, Badebo Smith. He's from Nigeria. He's had separate professional careers, both in government, public policy, practice research, and in clinical health. And he's now the Director General at the Nigerian Institute for Social and Economic Research. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, he co-authored the paper entitled ABCDEFGH. It just rolls off my tongue now. Um, I've been listening to it. And he's going to speak about the E for education and talk about the thoughts behind it and the need for education from an African perspective. And when he finishes, we're going to move straight the way from Nigeria over to Rwanda. And we're going to welcome Dudone Gakia. I hope I've said that correctly. I should have checked with you beforehand. Now, he's an author and advocate for post-conflict reconstruction. He's now project initiator uh, at the Dusego Empowerment Hub. And that's what he's going to talk about, a community-driven initiative aimed at empowering rural youth through the power of education, skills, and entrepreneurship. So it is my great pleasure, first of all, to welcome Dr. Follerin. Please, can you take the floor? Thank you very much, Josefa. Um, hello, everybody. 
Before I launch into the subject, I think I should make some effort to situate Africa, a contextual frame, so to speak. Uh, we live, we Africans, not the ones in diaspora, we live in a developing continent with several mineral rich, fragile states, post conflict, post colonial, post military rule, in the throes of insurgencies, military coups, and civil wars. We are targeting the sustainable development goals. I wonder, did I miss anything? Um, a friend of mine, uh, Tunji Lardner, describes Africa as a continent in time conflation. Some societies, mostly rural, are pre-modern. Most systems are in the industrial age at best, with a few people living in the capital and some of the largest cities in a postmodern world. That is, they have Starlink, they, 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 they use their cell phones and internet and interact with the world freely. If uh, cooperation is our ability to get along, that is acting together for the common good, one has to ask, who are we cooperating with? Each other? Are we cooperating with the wider world? And in any case, why the emphasis on education? My short answer is development. We, we equate knowledge with power, which produces wealth and ultimately impacts as development. Education is how we disseminate this knowledge. Um, of course, this is somewhat, uh, this is a somewhat linear view of education. The are traditional forms of education. There's uh, all the way to prehistory with Ubuntu and um, things that just kept society going. I think um, development in Africa right now has two main targets. One, the sustainable development goals, and the second is the Africa Free Trade Area Initiative. We have to pull this off in a world driven by binary thinking. The question are the, uh, that Lena asked, which is why are we not cooperating? My contribution would be that we have defined living in the world as a competitive game. You know, think game theory here. And um, there are going to be winners and losers. And everybody is striving to be on the winning side. Just by the way, there are fewer and fewer people on the winning end. If you throw in AI and you throw in uh, tech, quantum computing and so forth, they are only going to be, I don't know, four or five winners ultimately in the world and the rest of us will be observers to that game or consumers of what they throw at us. We have to pull development off in Africa in a world driven by binary thinking. However, the education system in Africa is dated. It is solidly geared towards uh, a binary world. We have testing, who wins, who loses in the classroom, who gets the plum jobs and who falls between the cracks. This is a singularly Darwinian arrangement and the loser gets absolutely nothing. 
he disappears on the general scheme of things. So very kindly, the rest of the world has said, oh, well, Africa should not lose or should not lose completely. So uh, the debate started, do we help with aid or trade? Well, between these two binaries sits a vast space that is cooperation. AFCTA, the African Free Trade Zone, will fail if based on a winner-take-all paradigm. The sustainable goals will not be reached in this vehicle either. So what are we really trading if we are talking about trade? What are we trading? I suggest looking at the future that we are trading knowledge. The knowledge economy is much bigger than the physical industrial economy and the bank economy, biotech, informatics, nanotechnology, and cognitive economies, for those who are not familiar with the term bank, is going to be huge. It's going to be so much larger than and I'm talking about several orders of magnitude here, than even the knowledge economy on which the internet, people like Google have made billions. This will be an economy talking in the trillions. We'll even be importing stuff from space to add to what we have here. Yet the educational system which is the infrastructure on which all this is based is on a pre-industrial model that is in Africa and an industrial model, even in the West, in the global North. So I asked, what does cooperation looks, look like? Cooperation in its broadest sense looks like Ubuntu goodwill, ethics, tolerance. I ask myself, how do we incorporate some of these principles into the Western model so we can all get along and develop at the same time? I've, I've had occasion to ask Lena that, is it possible to imagine a world where everybody wins instead of this win-lose arrangement? Of course, another view of cooperation is that it is a back door to obtaining social permissions. That is the, the permission to think differently for an African citizen who is bound by uh, convention, orthodoxy, and so on. It's, it's cooperation outside of the continent would grant social permissions for a situation where he, he or she would dare to engender inquiry, tear down barriers raised by dogma, ideology, and orthodoxy. In other words, establishment think. This is a continent where uh, uh, children are chastised for even behaving differently from their colleagues. Everybody should be the same. Cooperation, finally, in my view, involves exploring new commons. These commons, uh, we're talking about commons in the economic sense. The SDGs, subs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, are one such common. Cooperation, as uh, Pinda Wong puts it, involves a more covalent arrangement. You should listen to his uh, video on female money. Again, it's on the website of the Equinox meeting. It introduces the concept of a more female approach to thinking about development. 
In other words, it accepts the notion that everyone can win. Cooperative games as opposed to competitive games. For Africa, I think, to reach its goals, we have to move towards a more inclusive education system. We have to cross several domains, healthcare, the environment, the blue-green economies, the cooperative economies, physics. We have to basically rethink the way we encourage our children and young adults to think. It's not really about outcomes. We're trying to drill down into the very foundations of the thought process. Uh, Africa is a place where religion, culture, traditions are held in very high value. Unfortunately, the results has been a, a certain ossification, rigidity within our school systems so that we are trapped in rote, trapped in orthodoxy, and it's not getting better. At the same time, the world is moving away and at a rapid clip from this type of thinking. The question is, how will Africa catch that train on its way to development and the bink economy? Josepha, that's, um, that's it from me. Thank you. I just unmuted myself so that I wouldn't disturb you. Thank you very much, following. Can I just tell you that the video of Pindar Wong I've put the link into the chat for you. As Follerin mentioned, it would be worth listening and watching the interview that Lena did with him. Um, it's on that page. It's an excellent video and certainly worth watching. Follerin, thank you very much. We're going to pause you there because obviously once everyone comes back from the uh, breakout rooms, they're going to have lots of questions. We're going to move straight the way over from Nigeria to Rwanda. Uh, Diedone, I hope you're there. If you open your microphone, can you please take the floor and do your presentation? You're very welcome. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much, Josepha. I hope everyone can listen to me, right? Yes, great. So um, as you said, my name is uh, Diedone Gakide, um, from Rwanda. For those who don't know where it is located, it is in uh, Eastern um, and Central Africa. Um, I was born and uh, grew up in Dusego. Uh, it's a village in the southern part of the country and where I had uh, limited opportunities for um, a better education and, uh, and growth. So, um, uh, in in my story or my presentation, I will uh, I'm going to share with you how my story inspired me to to start uh, the Sego Empowerment Hub. Um, and as uh, we uh, we are exploring what it means to be a human, I believe uh, education is uh, is um, the cornerstone for fostering uh, cooperation, empathy, and uh, resilience. Uh, it allows us to reimagine our human experience, uh, creating a world where every child, regardless uh, where they grow up, uh, have the opportunity to strive, dream, and reach their full potential. Um, I started the Second Empowerment Hub uh, last year, even though I had a dream uh, many years back. Um, I, with the goal pro to provide the local youth and the children, especially in rural areas, with a space where they can uh, they can learn um, and play and grow. Uh, it, the hub is more than a building; it's just uh, where children in the rural areas in Rwanda where they meet, and for them to um, to experience what they could 
they will have with, without it and for them to explore their their potentials um, beyond the classroom. So the second empowerment hub is uh, it's just uh, an idea or space between school and home. So um, this organization or community center has uh, 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 two objectives. Uh, one is uh, in the youth engagement. So we provide after school programs and uh, to, um, to, uh, to allow children uh, to explore creativity. It's a place where they can meet and uh, explore or develop uh, skills uh, through play and art. Uh, now, uh, more focus on the poetry, songs, dance, and, uh, and drumming. So we also have uh, a program for personal development where we, uh, we provide uh, uh, ICT basic training, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, critical thinking. Um, we uh, we want uh, them to have a kind of you know better future to dream and also to have a job uh, beyond farming and uh, uh, low skilled jobs. So we uh, have a community library, and uh, we we are encouraging reading because many people say Rwandese or Africans they don't uh, read, and want this library to foster like culture of reading, uh, critical thinking. And um, also, uh, ex uh, want them to exploring them and creating a path way to knowledge based economy um, in our village or at or country at large. So, uh, talking about the challenges the rural communities in Rwanda have, one is um, the lack of basic resources. So, in Dusego, like many areas, uh, education. I mean better education, uh, clean water, electricity, uh, lower mother are scarf. Uh, children have to work to long distances to go to school and where there is a little uh, support for their growth. Uh, many parents never been um, to school and can't help their children with their studies. Um, and another challenge is um, is a space is a space for growth, like in uh, cities in Rwanda or elsewhere. Some some call them like a uh, uh, youth centers where there is like a playground or library or other things. So in our rural part, we don't have that. So then our children, like I had in myself uh, when I was when I when I was growing up there. So outside school. The children lack spaces to socialize, explore their talents, and develop their critical th thinking. So their their lives revolve around um, uh, like helping a household, um, like fetching water, leaving the time for them to to learn or play. As you know, how uh, play. Uh, how now play is important in in the learning process of of, uh, of the children. So now for the uh, what we see the power of education to to address all these uh, challenges. Um, we want this center to help them with the exposure. Um, and myself, I had the chance to study abroad. I learned that to develop, you need to be exposed to opportunities and ideas beyond your immediate environment. So this hub um, provide this exposure. We offer space where children and youth can learn, dream, and grow in ways they never imagined. So, and uh, the law for them to uh, to achieve this, we are now providing the the English lessons for the for the communication. Our education is. Uh, is in English, but many people, especially in rural areas, they can't even express themselves in English. And we have art sessions, and we are helping them to have access to library. And this program uh, programs give children to a break from their day routines and allow them to imagine new possibilities uh, for their futures. Um, Paul. Back to my personal experience, when I was 23, I, I wrote a book um, and that uh, 
was focusing on how the genocide that happened in my country affected my generation. And this book uh, opened doors for me, uh, including the opportunity to study abroad. Um, and I'm doing this to, to, to give back to my community. Um, and I want to offer youth what I have found uh, abroad and also in uh, developed cities in Rwanda, uh, especially a space for them to learn, grow, and dream of a bright future. The disabled empowerment is my way to, to achieve this. Um, um, so the uh, empowerment hub, the same empowerment hub is more than just education. It's about giving children in rural Rwanda the right to be children. Uh, uh, I mean, a place where they can uh, meet and play, learn, and also dream. So it's about transforming our village by developing the potential of its youngest members. Um, and am I inviting you all to think about how we can continue to build environment where young people can thrive, especially in Africa, whether it is through partnerships, uh, resources, or simply uh, sharing ideas. Um, I believe together we can uh, create sustainable and positive change. Um, yeah, Joseph, that was it. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the, for discussion and, uh, and also questions. <laughs> so much Judane and uh, just such such a warm hearted um, story about you giving something back based on your experiences mm -hmm. so um, in a moment I'm going to hand over to Lena to um, sort the rooms for you just to remind you you're going to in your small rooms it'll be small groups of three or four what did you just hear from following and Judane what did you learn? There's something really different that you had not known about before. And most importantly, what would be a good question to ask the speakers when you come back? So over to you, Lena, for Thank you. logistics. Yes, I have some amazing groups for everybody. And um, there, there's like three or four people in, in each one of them. And... They're only cool people, nice people, and curious people. So uh, don't be afraid to join. They're very friendly, too. Um, and uh, you'll get 20 minutes. And uh, first of all, we encourage you to have a good time. And then uh, when you get back here, uh, we will uh, have time for discussion with the speakers. And the speakers will stay here with us in the main room. Because if we send the speakers out into the breakout room, they're just going to keep talking. Or you're going to ask them a lot of questions instead of talking to each other. And we want everybody to be engaged here. So uh, have fun in the breakout rooms and I'll see you in 20 minutes. You, Donnie, thank you so much for your presentations. Thank you. Yeah, really, welcome. really interesting to, to listen to. And uh, it'll be even more interesting to hear what they come back with regarding questions that they'd like to ask you or perhaps just um push you a little further for more of your more of your stories thank you for your positive feedback <laughs> yeah appreciate absolutely it. i mean you're doing what uh Fullerin is uh asking for i guess yeah mm -hmm. the, the question the question i suppose is how to um make Duenda's, uh, Duodeny's uh, concept, how to disperse it, you know, put one in every neighbor, in any, in every neighborhood, you know, even, even within the cities. Yeah. True. You know? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because I, uh, I know somebody who's, She's been a speaker here. She's uh, also a karate uh, champion. She's building a center in Lusaka that has a lot of the same qualities, doing a lot of the same things. And it's it's the same idea, very much the same idea. So she's also tried to log on today and she can't get connected on it, the uh, internet, unfortunately. But uh, when I heard a lot of what you had to say, I said, oh, this, this sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. Good idea. 
Yeah, uh, what you you said uh, when I did this, uh, I thought it was just for my small village, and also for um, for the two schools in the neighborhood. And what we experienced in the summer camp we organized, like we had so many people from you know long distances right. from ten schools, and what I realized that we need more than uh, this kind of concept in many uh, in many parts, not only of course in rural areas but also in the cities. Excuse, um, uh, how many young people? you have within the um the net the hub at the moment i mean i don't obviously the numbers will change as they go along but roughly how many how many young people are involved in some of the development activities and the singing and the poetry and um the entrepreneurship and the skills development do you think you've got at the moment yeah we have uh welcomed the 226 200 and, and 26. Yes. Yes. That's a lot more than I was thinking of. <laughs> That's a yeah. lot more. And do you have volunteers in the hub as well that help you, the Empowerment Hub? Yes, now I have um, teams of uh, three people uh, uh, during uh, summer camp. I mean, it was like a long holidays in Rwanda. It's when like, uh, these people were coming uh, every day, also hired uh, uh, another person and for the um for for dancing or drumming we have uh people from the community who uh who volunteered to teach the the, the children or the young people yeah that's really that's really nice do you have anybody from industry do, do you have a good relationship between um the empowerment hub and any businesses any industries um not yet we not just yet. we just started uh just uh through uh uh like community cooperation um like uh, local government leaders or community in general yeah. and uh in the area we, we um we don't have like there is no actually there is no uh, private sector there is no industry or companies yes. right gotcha i was going to say maybe following could give you a few um ideas about how to connect to various people but if they um if you have a shortage of the industries there then yeah that that's slightly, no. slightly hard to do. yeah like in, in my story um like many people, including my parents, were depending on a subsistence uh, agriculture, and uh, yeah, and the lot of the the the, um, the hub is to for the children to meet other role models, to have a kind of a different future compared to their parents. Uh, before starting it, I always met children, and when I asked them what they want to be like to become uh in the future they many said like a uh, primary teachers moto taxi driver you know a catholic priest because these are only people they could see uh in the community and uh, inspire them and i created this to be able to also invite uh, people with different professions so that pe uh, the children can have uh, the, you know, dreaming is free, but to be able to dream something, maybe you need to to know it. <laughs> to, to maybe to dream take that from you yes. and use it somewhere. Dreaming is free. I like it. <laughs> yeah, you can dream anything, but maybe for the kids that you need to to dream to become a doctor, maybe you you need to know a doctor or an engineer or a military officer. If you don't have a a chance to see him or or her talk to you, then sometimes you are limited even in dreaming, even if it is just That's free of course. Yeah. I I think um perhaps you know a, a, an urban version of this would be equally useful. Mm -hmm. Um if you if you think about it the 
the way children are taught in schools in even in the big cities is they are going after a certificate they are sure. going after a trophy you know mm -hmm. and they expect a good job and that's that's the story of their lives um what you've done is introduce a a, uh, a totally uh, different way of communicating what life is about to very young children. If you, if you, if if one is able to move uh, even city kids from the grind of competition, you know, I have to get into this university and and because. Um, what 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 I was trying to argue in my paper is that the future is not like that. You're not going to, because you have a degree in engineering, the, the AI will probably do a much better job of engineering than you possibly can. So, so um, everybody or most people are going to end up in, in the space where what we call the cooperative space. There's, there's going to be uh, a culture of volunteering, a culture of um, just giving and trying to make life better because most of the things we do now, most of the technical skills we do now will be on, on automatic offer. You know, so so um, I'm thinking that you know you could have an urban version of this program in in uh, Joseph's neighbor. L Lina, how do you pronounce Joseph's concept? The neighbor neighborocracy. Yes, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's true. You know, you talked Bink and you said it was biotech, and then I missed the I, and then you said nanotech, and I missed the C. Uh, biotech, uh, informatics, um, the C is cognitive sciences. Thank you. You know, um, you know, the that convergence between uh, between man and machine, I think, you know, and yes. you know the medical sciences, psychology, and so and so forth. And the yeah. N was nanotech, wasn't it? And the N was nanotech. Yeah. Because yes. you said that that's what you thought the future was, Bink. So nor normally it's called NBIC by the uh, nano engineers. So if, if you want to get all the literature from uh, research uh, academia, it's N NBIC. Uh, but I called it Bink because then we can talk about a Bink age and Bink jobs, just like we talk about the Iron Age or the Bronze Age or... Bink technology, like we talk about iron technology, Thank so it can become sort of part of that historical categorization of of uh, technological development. Yeah, um, and Bic does age doesn't quite work the same. No, way. it was like like Bic. I mean, you could say it, but no, 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 Bic. Bic. Well, that's because they wanted their letter first. That's why they made it that. Um, Joe Doney, how far outside of a city are you travel distance wise or travel time wise? Um, two hours and a half. Yeah, that's a lot. By what bus, moped, Good drive? Drive. Yeah, with bus it could be more. <laughs> <laughs> with the time of uh, waiting and uh, connecting, okay. and, uh, because at some point you um, you leave the main load, then you take off load. Those who are familiar with what uh, off road means in Africa. Yes, I've I've been to Niger, I've been to Uganda, oh. I know what off road is, but uh, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, I mean the the African. I mean, there's something about Africa that is just home. I mean, that's where we're mm -hmm. all originating, and that is that is correct. Yeah. And and I can sometimes I can just miss the sound of Africa, uh, which by that I mean the village Africa, because that is, I think my grandparents and great grandparents had the exact same sound with the chicken and the roosters and the cats and dogs and goats and um, village uh, sounds and birds, different birds probably, but the domesticated animals would pretty much sound the same. Um, and there's just something very very peaceful about it and it's it's that's really what it what it means to be human it, it is uh where we all came from um and um and then when you see it in in uh, africa and you see how hard it is to make a living and join the real economy and and work yourself beyond subsistence farming yeah. um you just see how i mean awful uh the I mean, all kinds of infrastructure uh, are in uh, the majority of Africa. So the so the young people and the kids that you have in your center, two and a half hours uh, from the from the nearest city, do they? I mean, do they dream of going to the city? They dream of going to Europe. They uh, do they dream of of making their farms bigger? You introduce different kinds of jobs to them um but um what what do they what what do they think about their future uh, life as adults and uh, where they're coming from the same as uh, the ideas i i had when i was their age is their dream is to to leave the village and move to uh to uh nearby cities and then to kigari and then from Kigali to Europe or, or North America <laughs> for, for, for a better future. That's what I think. And um, I had trans to move from there to live in Kigali and later in Europe. And I also wanted to uh, somehow to contribute to, to, to address this issue of like, there are many young people moving to Kigali to do nothing because the number is more than the opportunities in Kigali. Um, same uh, in Europe, I lived in the Netherlands. Uh, I visited the countries like Belgium and France, and they also saw many uh, homeless people uh, who left even good jobs in Africa to there for better jobs, but uh, who didn't make it. Um, so yeah, I created this also for the people from Kigali to come and uh, speak to to the youth and the children there, even those who live in Europe come and share their personal stories so that they can have the, um, just have the stories, of course, it's for themselves to decide, but at least they have access to to the true stories and all kinds of story types uh, uh, around. Um, what, yeah. what are you thinking? Sorry, I said Fuller in. What are you thinking? There are things. No, no, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm thinking that you know, uh, um, th there has to be an infrastructure, some arrangement that allows people to live in both places, in Kigali and the village. Mm -hmm. You know, like not everyone, not everyone in England lives in London. You know, and not everyone aspires to live in London. You know, because there's a train, there's 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 a, a good service. It, should you want, on the odd occasion, to visit, you know, it, it's no problem. But here in Africa, you are forced to a choice. You know, you you live here or you live there, and and uh, here doesn't work because. You don't have a job, you don't have the skills, you don't have the, the wherewithal to function in the city. And there uh, is too dismal. You, 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 your ambitions are to get away from that uh, setup. You know, but every, every Christmas, 
the, the, the whole of Kigali, the whole of the city wants to move to the, to the village. So, so you, you realize that there's an attraction there, but it's not enough uh, to keep them permanently engaged. Yeah. It's a very yeah. good point. I'll never complain about our train service ever again. Remember <laughs> that. At least we have one. <laughs> I would like to share an anecdote from Denmark. Uh, the Faroe Islands in the North Sea, they have around like, I don't know, 50,000 people living there and a lot of islands and there's one kind of city and at some point they invested heavily in bridges and roads to some of the more distant islands and what happened was that finally people could move away from those islands so they just moved spent used the road one time and that was to get into the city and uh because now they could actually move so uh but that's uh that's islands and uh, now we have people coming back from the uh from the breakout rooms so um i'll just wait for let, a moment until everybody's back let's see what uh oh well, they got 32 seconds then it'll be here it's a good sign when they don't want to leave the breakout room that it means really they've had a good time amazing amazing session congratulations amazing session very very rich very rich session and i'm so looking forward to hearing the questions and the discussions and what uh, Follerin and Giudone have started. I think they've started something. Uh, and that's what I'm interested in hearing. Hello, welcome back, everyone. I think, yes, it looks like we have nearly everybody back. Well, thank you for coming back. And I hope you've had some really interesting discussions. We've now got a good 30 minutes to reflect to share some of the things that you've been discussing in the rooms and also to take your questions um, for following and you donate. So there are a couple of ways that you can do this. You can click on, if you go to the bottom of the screen, there's a little heart under, uh, under which it says react. And if you click on that little heart, it actually has an option for you to raise your hand. So you can raise your digital hand and we will come to you um, in order. Uh, alternatively, if you don't want to speak, you can type your question into the chat and we'd be very happy to ask the question for you. But it'd be so nice to hear you speak. And this might be a question from you personally, or it might be a question that's come from the discussions in your group. So I'm just going to open the chat window so that I can see if anybody types in there. And uh, let me ask you, please, to pop your digital hand up if you would like to be first either with a comment about what you heard from Follerin and Dudonet or a question. And I'm sure you do have questions. I know we've been we've been chattering away while you've been in the rooms as well. So we've got questions. While you're thinking, um, Follerin, may I come to you first? Uh, you covered so much in your presentation and you really focused on the fact that education was dated and yet it is so influential for the future from your research um what do you think will make would make the most difference to education for that shift to start to happen at this stage i know i know there's a lot going on with the government now um with your president uh, tinubu's administration who is um putting agent uh, education at the top of the agenda but what in your professional opinion do you think needs to to start to kick start some of the changes um i i think we we need to go back to the um to the foundations. Um, you can't have analog minds planning for digital futures. It just won't work. You can't have old people who stopped learning when the, the printing press was invented to, to uh, uh, show up and start talking about quantum computers and, and so forth. 
even the infrastructure of the universities, uh, high schools, is, is so frayed that we don't have, um, you know, free student internet in Nigeria. Each, each student is still carrying around a little dongle. He has to pay for this. And these are, these, uh, in my view, are public goods. The government has to make that investment. Then we have to retrain the, uh, the trainers, the professors, the teachers. They are still talking to the students, talking down at them. And um, uh, they, they, they seem unaware of the fact that information is not what is, is being sought after anymore. The information is, is available and it's there. And, and more so in future, there will be no need for somebody to tell you or to give you information that you have to write down. There, there, there's, there's a struggle with this very basic idea. Yeah. I'm just smiling at the the word dongle. I haven't heard the word dongle being used for a very long time. So thank you for, for that. But yes, that's uh, that's a very, very interesting response. There is a question, um, and I don't know, it's from Julie, and I don't know whether it's for Judene or for you following. Julie, please, please uh, unmike or unmute your mic, and uh, the floor is yours to ask the question. Yes, um, I have been out for a few hours, unfortunately, so I'm not um, I'm not um, right on track. But uh, I have always been wondering about how uh, why it is that the, that uh, typically poor people is so attracted by the big cities when when uh, when uh, they normally don't have a chance to make it success to make a success there. Uh, it could be a dream of, uh, of course, it's a dream of um, it, uh, getting a better life for themselves and their families. But since they, they move to the big cities and often get into slums and um, decline, uh, then perhaps it would be more, more, much more better for them to, um, to try to uh, improve life where they actually are. So, so my question is, why is it that the, that the, some uh, people, it could be very poor people or desperate people, find the big cities so attractive because the, the statistics uh, typically show that they don't have a chance to improve life there? Is it because of lack of information? Is it because the hope, hope um, the hope of, of the dreams, are so um, profound that the, it the shadows uh, of for all uh, reasonable uh, thinking, or what is it? That's my question. Thank you, Julie. Does I it make? I hope. I hope it makes sense, or I'll try to elaborate. So maybe we pass to to both of you. Uh, who would like to go first, following or Dudone? Dudone, why don't you? Why don't you go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, part of the answer you just mentioned, the lack of um, information or the tourist toll of uh, living in the cities. Um, but for some people or young people, sometimes it's uh, the question of uh, do or die. Go, go to cities or die in a, in a rural part. So um, first of all, there is lack of uh, infrastructures. I, I, in my case, uh, as um, let me talk from my own experience, my own experiences. Uh, back home, we had no electricity, we had no water. There was no internet or TV. Uh, so for me, uh, infra infrastructures, good roads, or of simple things like a TV at home or fridge or, or nice roads was very attractive for me to, to go to cities. And um, 
so first of all, there is no like good schools in our in our in our rural part. So if you want to really have a better future, they need to 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 go there. Um, and even if you go there just to study, there is no there is nothing that can make you come back because you can't uh, have a better job. There is no hospital. If you did medicine in the cities to come and you know be a, a doctor, uh, there is no um. Like these people in the rural areas, as I mentioned in in the case of my home village, they are depending on subsistence agriculture, uh, which means they have food and uh, home, but they don't have money. So if it, nothing can do for them for them to pay you. Uh, so if you did engineering, there's nothing uh, for you to come and use your, your educational experience in the rural part. So, and then... Um, for this to end, I see as the the role of uh, of the government, um, uh, like we like in our case, the the government has done uh, a good job in um, in uh, decentralization. Uh, but if it, it happens with the also uh, the uh, private sector or NGOs, like for the big offices, also to have. Uh, headquarters in a in a countryside, this will help for the people there to have a better job. Uh, same as for the for the infrastructures. Uh, when I go to work at the in Dusego, I have no good internet, so I can't even uh, attend this kind of meeting online because I can't. There is no access to to the internet. So even if I'm happy when I'm there with the you know. Uh, less uh, pollution and <laughs> and crowds, but I can't spend there like a week. Otherwise, I'm you know, I'm also uh, out of the rest of uh, the world. I can't like uh, read a book online or or news. So um, yeah. yeah, that's what uh, I I see. Thank you so much, Judane. Uh, let me hand over to Follerin for maybe a different perspective or from from the way that you want to respond to that question. I, I think the there are many myths uh, surrounding city life. Uh, the, the few, the short glimpses that people have of city life is so glittering that, you know, they are transported to another world. Then they get to the city, you know, through any means and they fail. Then the shame takes over. You cannot leave one situation, go away and come back to tell a story of failure. So the person gets trapped in the city. And, and in fact, you see a lot of it uh, in, in cities. You, you find people who are jobless and homeless taking selfies in their one Sunday uh, uh, clothes and sending it back to the village to, to show the people there that we are in fact doing well. The, his story is the opposite. And, and to, the, to the extent that government continues to look at a rural development, not as an asset, not as as part of the economy, it just uh, it just spends tokens in that direction, such that you know uh, nothing happens. Like, like we, we said during the breakout sessions, it would be very different if there was a train that ran to the rural areas and to the to the city that connected the city with the rural areas then people would could live and work in different places and you know you you'd have some some sort of equilibrium uh, uh going yes thank you very much indeed and actually in the chat box you can see that yuliana from romania is uh, uh making some comparisons also with uh, what's going on in romania and brian also talks very similar to you following about the mirage that the city is the el dorado it's the place to go i'd like to bring in uh sola if i may um who has uh, their hand up 
Uh, I believe you have a question or a comment or something. Sola, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the question or comment uh, is for well, either of the speakers. Um, education is key, as Falani says. But in my mind, the greatest impediment to education in Africa are corruption and mismanagement of resources. As long as these are not frontally and robustly addressed, we will continue to be de 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 bedeviled by underdevelopment. Um, example is Nigeria. The least educated part of Nigeria is the least developed and is created by a vicious cycle. The resources are diverted, the resources meant for education are diverted and we have large swathes of illiterates. The illiteracy creates poverty, hopelessness, helplessness, and ignorance, which enables further corruption and mismanagement of resources. And in Nigeria, the result is that those, that, those particular parts of the country is where we have terrorism and violent insurgency. So, what we have is a situation where the least developed part of, of Nigeria is the, is the poorest part of the country. But the, the reason is that corruption and mismanagement of resources, that's the, re that's, that's, that's the reason. So um, we're not talking here about catapulting ourselves into the next century. We're talking about the basics. Um, in a part of the country where you have about 10 million people who are who have not who have never entered a school. So for me, the issue of corruption and mismanagement are critical and should be and must be um, addressed. If not, sorry, education will not even get going to get there. Um Polari, what do you think? Um um i i agree with you but i think you take a, a somewhat linear view of the problem um even if you do control corruption yeah corruption is eroding and 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 talking about massive bleeding the 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 resources that should go into education but I, I, I have had occasion to imagine a world in Nigeria corruption free. The, what you would get is a mass of literate people, but who are not geared to the, to the future. Secondly, technology makes it possible at least in the cities and, and uh, places where you have the internet to bypass some of the effects of these, um, um, or some of the effects, the negative effects of corruption. You know, you can now log in to the University of London network and get an education from there. You can, get certification online. You can basically bypass the entire uh, problem, the entire local problem. So I'm not, I'm not doubting for a second that what you, what you are pointing at is, is, is very important. However, I, I think that um, there are more elements to this problem than just uh, the, the corruption question. Well, I mean, a follow-up is, it, can you have access to technology if you have never been into a school? I don't think so. Good question. Good question. Julie has her hand up. Yes. I'm sorry that I cannot find my digital hand, so I have my normal hand here. A normal <laughs> hand is fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that when this uh, the um, uh, the overall um, 
uh, what you call framing of this meeting is what it means to be human. And I can tell you, I'm often very provoked about my uh, some of my nearest friends and colleagues. I'm from Denmark, uh, and I'm very often very provoked by nearest near friends and colleague colleagues who are not even grateful about all the opportunities we have in this country. So uh, when I hear about what is going on out in the world and all the all the challenges that you that you meet and you have to conquer, so um, I'll just say that uh, what it means to be human. My friends, they are not the slightest aware of how privileged they are, and I'm so sorry to say that uh, that they are very educated, a lot of them, but their 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 span their mindset is only about themselves, their own lives, their own children, their own career. So what is going on in the world, uh, it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't make any difference from them, I'm sorry to say. And when we, we try to financially support uh, different kinds of um, projects and so on in the world, uh, a lot of my friends says, oh, I'm not, I don't know where the money goes to. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of administration. So I don't, I will never donate a, a penny. And that's, that's also how it means to be a hu human, a very privileged human. I'm so sorry to say that in this, uh, this privileged country, Denmark, that I come from. A very, in my opinion, my well-educated colleagues and friends have a very narrow-minded perspective uh, concerning what's going on, on in the world. I'm sorry to say. Julie, yeah. thank you very much. Lena, you have your hand up. Please come in. Yeah, I'm also in Denmark, and I would like to add something to that because I, I so agree with you. And not just is it individuals who don't care, it's also people in the institutions. Um, there is a, a French organization that has a global event in January called Learning Planet, and I can highly recommend anybody to join. And there are people from around the globe, uh, including some of the poorest parts of, of the world, and they go online and they join this global conversation. I have tried for the past two years to get Danish organizations interested in joining. And what they tell me, the reason for not joining is that, oh, we don't have any resources. And I'm like... You have a mountain of resources and there are people in, in the rest of the world who don't even have, you know, daily food. And here you are and you don't even want to spend uh, two hours on a Zoom meeting to uh, share some of the knowledge that we have or to learn from somebody in the rest of the world. I am embarrassed. Um, and for the past two or three years i think i've participated three the first year i participated and realized i was the only dane participating or at least representing an organization the second and the third year i tried to get somebody else to join and there was no interest because they didn't have resources so i'm so fed up with these privileged danes from time to time and this is actually much more fun because this is real um so yeah uh we uh we carry our part of of uh, the reason for this and we need to uh, make people wake up here Thank, Thank you, you Lena. I can see Melvin has his hand up. Um, so we just have time to to pick up your comment or your question, please. Thank you, uh, Zefa. Um, I have two comments. The first is to commend <laughs> um, this organization for what you're doing because it's so fundamental in the sense that if you uh, Af you can't discuss Africa's problems without examining the nature of the states. And in state formation, people come together first in their moral capacity before they ordain a constitution in their political capacity. And that morality pre uh, presupposes that we are human, we're not animals or some uh, robot. And often we take it for granted, which is why I think it's very insightful to even go back and ask that question. Uh, yeah, if, 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 we, if we lack that moral fabric for whatever, whatever reason, the state that we create 
may not be able to deliver. It may be a misplaced expectation of the state. And yet the state is so central, and that is my second issue is to explain why we can't understand what happens to Africa without examining the state. Take the question of cities. There is no doubt that cities are attractors because there are agglomeration economies. It offers lots of benefits, but like everything else, after a while there is this economies, you know, congestion, the housing and all the stuff we talk about. But you can address those things through spatial development initiatives, which is a fancy way of saying you spread the pie. Even in China, Shanghai moved their stuff to Shenzhen so it can take up the pressure. I've argued before that Johannesburg should give some to Limpopo so they could take some of their benefits and take some of their problems as well. And maybe in the morning, the traffic can go the other way instead of everybody going to one central place. New York all over the place. So yes, we can dismiss cities, but we also can't dismiss the fact that we need to develop the rural areas also to decongest the eventual uh, um, um, uh, overgrowth of the cities. But these things don't happen because of the politics of power. The, you cannot assume that government is benevolent. So it can't, then brings up the public choice mechanism. How do we get, get government to choose in a way that benefits everybody? Uh, particularly when the government is the one with the power that needs to make the changes that's going to make them Gorbachev. Gorbachev is always my favorite person because he was so good, he put himself out of business. You know, um, so I use that as a metaphor to show that you need a saint. But we can have a saint. We have to have the people become the agents of change. In Africa, that is complicated by external influence. And that's where the rest of the world also becomes implicated in this. So nobody, and that's, we cannot discuss Africa's issue without the state and without external influence. And I don't see that being engaged with the same gusto in which the hands are pointed to the Africans. They're bad, but they're not the only one. And any hope we have for changes is complicated and made difficult by external influences. I just wanted to lay that on the table as they had a frank talk. Thank you. Melvin, just... thank you very much for that contribution. I would like to hand over to Lena. She has her hand up. Uh, I don't know if it's a question or a response to that or the next stage. But that's so, actually a, you. That's actually a, a response to what Melvin says, because one of the th there are two things that I see in political development in Europe historically, and then democratization, economic development, and the rest of the world. When we created the political system that we have in the West, it was hand in hand with industrialization, which means that the investors in the capitalist economy who owned the factories and uh, made the uh, profit on it, they reinvested that money in their local community because they built big houses and, and they didn't send the money out of the country. Um, and they struggled with local workers who wanted uh, better conditions for, for their work. In the developing economies and after the like 1960s and onwards, foreign investments in developing economies have meant that uh, the investors pulled the money out uh, once there was a profit. And we've also given aid, which is basically loans that uh, benefit our own companies. So there's a complete, uh, completely different situation. And in that situation, we from the West have tried to convince people that they should have democracy. But what we're voting about in the West is the struggle between the workers and the capitalists. That's basically the right, left, right spectrum of the political spectrum. If you don't have that economic conflict in a society because you don't have industrialization with local investment or local money, what are you going to vote about? And what I see in many places is that people vote about which tribe or which ethnic group should be represented in the parliament, which means you're not actually voting about politics, but you're voting about, let me be frank, whose cousin should be president. Um, and that is corruption. So there is a political system that does not match the 
economic infrastructure and the political issues in society, or it has to be redefined in some way. So I, I see some structural differences in the system that we developed in the West and that we're trying to export. And my personal suggestion, one of them would be that we need to set up some kind of stepwise implementation of rule of law and local government before we try to create national governance democratically, because otherwise it's going to be too attractive to be in the top of the uh, national uh, political power system and have access to all the resources that go into a state. It's less attractive to be corrupt in a small town. Uh, so you can you can implement the democratic principles and learn how to work democratically in smaller entities where people can actually have oversight than start at the top. So that was um, that was a little bit of uh, more fuming from uh, from the north here. Um, we need to <laughs> rethink how we do this. Thank you, Lena. And I can see comments in the in the chat as well. In fact, may I take uh, part of your comment and pose it to um, both following and, and Judone, because you were saying about um, a major paradigm shift in the approach to modernization and development. And you did couch that within the promotion of your rural opportunities. So following, would you be um, willing just to pick pick up um, the issue about major paradigm shifts that uh, Sam has mentioned, then maybe Judani would like to come in after that. Um, I, I think, I think one of the, uh, I think it was Melvin who spoke about the role of the state. We are, we are kind of, of trapped between what the World Bank and the Bretton Woods institutions sell and what common sense dictates that we should be uh, up to in, in Africa. You know, th there's a wholesale sense of, okay, you take this loan, take this money, uh, improve your budgets. Where, where there is no attention paid to the last mile. The, the, that is when the boots meet the ground, um, what's, what's, what's happened to the rail system in, in Africa? Uh, you, you know, the, the insurgencies we face uh, are being funded externally. If, if not funded, they are being supplied externally. Where do all these guns come from? They are not locally made. You know, who has an interest in keeping Africa unstable? And, and you know, these questions run off on their own. I'm not quite sure what Sam means by a major paradigm shift, but I, I, I suspect that... A better job could be done of local governments uh, paying attention to rural infrastructure, uh, pulling resources together. But as as Shola said, all these things cannot happen with this level of corruption. And where does the corruption money go? It goes to london it goes to paris it goes to new york so so we 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 are we are we're kind of trapped in this arrangement where the elite of nigeria are behaving like the old colonials as soon as there's some money on the table they want to extract it and export it yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that following. Uh, Dieudonne, is there anything you would like to respond to either the conversation we're having now or to um, have a final comment from something you would like to leave us with to think about? Could you unmute, please, Dieudonne? I just want to connect with uh, how we started the meeting why are we not uh, cooperating? Um, and some of the causes Swat friend had just said, like the corruption 
and uh, those who are benefiting from uh, instability uh, of our countries um, as a country or like within the country, like a development of our of our, our part. And that can be uh, uh, external factors or even local factors. Um, yeah, the, I think the most important is to start why, yes, why we are not cooperating and then try to uh, address the the, each, the issues. Um, yeah, just to back to know um, what it means to be humans. And for me, it's like it's... it's uh, and we is... keep coming back to that, don't we? The yeah, what right. it means to be human, which yes. is really the, the thread that underpins all of this. And I know that in the next event, um, yeah. we go to Europe. And so I suppose, Juliana, you could either talk in the next one or talk in this one. But you were making, um, Juliana, you were making comparisons between what uh, Giudone and Follerin were talking about with what's happening in Romania. Um, I don't know if you could unmic or unmute your mic to uh, s tell us where you see the, the similarities, apart from the fact you said it's crowded and chaotic and a lot of mess, which I thought was very telling. Are you there, Juliana? I don't think she is. No? I yes, she is. I can see her on screen. Okay. Are you okay, Juliana? Can you un unmute there you are hello hi there can you hear me we can thank you so much you've got it uh, there you are well, whatever the two speakers were talking about um uh, in home because we do have the same thing here even though uh, let's say we're not um we probably share the same torture history uh we had to fight the uh, ottoman empire and russians and <laughs> all kinds of uh, conquerors so um and we had to you know share the space with them and uh what we're left with was uh, a not so happy you know uh trail just because uh, we're still fighting to uh, get back on our feet economically and let's you mentioned say also or about um, educationally um, we're still mm -hmm. sorry but there's a time de delay between us I'm sorry I interrupted you please continue <laughs> okay so um, I was saying that whatever they're, they're talking about is just that uh, um, I, I can find them here in Romania uh, talking about the big cities and the um, lack of opportunities in the rural area um, I, I was um, talking to you know the different session earlier today that there is like a, a very smooth and well let's say hopefully it will uh, keep going uh, shift to back to rural area uh, we have people uh, leaving their corporate jobs in the big cities and going back to their parents or grandparents villages and starting businesses uh, some of them have degrees in, in uh, agriculture farming uh, animal breeding so it, it looks promising but we'll see how it goes we're still crowded in the cities and uh um i never i never understood uh, born and raised in the you know the capital of romania but uh still i would uh, um i would move anywhere <laughs> in the country um just to get out of uh whatever we have here but again uh we still have you know uh, kids mesmerized by uh, a big city um, they see pictures, uh, movies, uh, they hear stories. So they want to come and, you know, get a share of what's going on in here. And, uh, well, some stories have happy endings, others don't, uh, which is sad. Or uh, we have a lot of people leaving the country. Um, it's even sadder. Um, Very true. Very true. So, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for coming.
Thank you for coming on camera. Romania. And, uh, a lot of women in Romania, in Romania. Thank you for sharing. And uh, very interesting what you're saying about sure, yeah. <laughs> it moving in the other direction and going from the cities back out to the rural. So uh, it was a lo lovely um, example and, and builds upon some of the discussion that we have had now. I want to say thank you very, very much mm -hmm. to following and uh, Giudone. Sure. And it yeah. is my pleasure to mm -hmm. hand back to Lena and to Robert, because I think we have a word cloud to to look at and some some final final comments. Oh, oh, definitely a bit of digital. Should we have some digital clapping going on? Just go down to your. That's it. A nice bit of digital hands and clapping. Thank you so much. <laughs> Over to you, Lena. Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, that story about the poor people moving into the cities, uh, failing and sending home selfies uh, with uh, them wearing the one nice shirt that they have. Same story as when the Europeans uh, colonized, immigrated to the United States and Australia and elsewhere. Uh, they left home, told people that gold was lying around in the streets. And it was just a success story and they were miserable. So there's something here that hasn't changed the slightest bit, unfortunately. Um, we have a word cloud and uh, Robert, can you please share that with us? All right. Fear is big. Selfishness, loss of hope, being rejected, life as a competitive game, inherent hu human fault lines, fear of judgment. We will uh, gather these and post them online, share them with you after uh, the event. So um, there is a lot of opportunity for, for more collaboration and for getting over the fear and the competitive game. Um, I would like us to uh, share the link for our network in the chat for those of you who are not uh, members yet. Uh, you can join us free of charge. We can continue the conversation in there and we will also at some point continue. Uh, we've had such a, a lovely day today with so many great discussions that we should definitely start some kind of activities program between now and the next uh, global meeting on Equinox, which will be in March. And uh, Bob and I have actually talked about uh, starting a uh, study circle about the book, what it means to be human so that we can read chapters and discuss them. So we do have things in the pipeline, just haven't had time to uh, put it online. But fortunately, we have all your emails so we can write you and uh, let you know when things are happening. Um, what else can we share in the chat? For instance, the ABCDFGH article so that you can um, read it. And now I see that Yusifa shared the link to the article. Uh, the article has the eight things that we need to take into account as we try to solve global problems. And then there are 11 suggestions to what we can do differently, some very concrete suggestions. And one of them is to align the economy with the biological systems. And that is what we're going to hear about in Europe in 15 minutes. Um, and the gentleman who's going to talk about that is Ulrich Learning. And he is 93 years old and uh, a really brilliant, brilliant thinker who has figured out how we can uh, rethink the economy. So um, this is a cliffhanger and uh, we're looking very much forward to seeing you in 15 minutes when we uh, reappear in Europe. So Josefa, thank you for hosting the session. Follow Ren and uh, Giordane. Thank you so much for your uh, contributions and also thank you to uh, Robert for doing all the practical stuff with the slides and stuff and for all of you for participating and contributing so that we could have some lively conversations. Mm -hmm.